Okay, I'm here, main stage. Uh, let's get this conversation going. Uh, so my name is Asin Chandra and uh, co-founder and CEO at Immersa. And, uh, you know, we, we set up this topic intentionally to be a little bit controversial, which is who owns growth at SaaS companies. So we have three different points of views here from uh, three different parts of the business, uh, RevOps, sales, and customer success. I'm going to ask uh, Seamus to go ahead and introduce himself first, representing the RevOps point of view. Hi, folks. My name is Seamus Reese Earl. I'm the CEO of Carabiner Group. We provide RevOps as a service to uh, growing SaaS startups. Uh, and, you know, I was born and raised in the RevOps world, so uh, die hard uh, on that perspective. Cool. Thank you, Seamus. And uh, Irene, you want to go next, representing uh, customer success? Absolutely. Glad to be here. My name's Irene Lefton. I am the co-chair of the Customer Success Leadership Network. I'm a serial entrepreneur who primarily works in early stage startups, uh, building out customer success teams. Awesome. And uh, Rob, last but not the least, uh, we, sales point of view. Great. Thanks, the same. I'm uh, happy to be here. Rob Vandenberg, current head of global channels and partnerships at user testing. Uh, user experience company, have uh, run field organizations as CRO and been CEO of startups as well. Uh, excited to be here. Thank you, Rob. And um, the, the, here's how we're going to run this session. So I'm going to throw out a few questions and uh, get the conversation started. Uh, we'd love to see participation from the audience. Uh, so, and I'm assuming we're in the public for a session to get the audience uh, questions uh, in here. I think they put them in the Q&A. Q and A. Q &A. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, so we'll we'll look for your uh, questions here in the Q and A section, and uh, let's get this rolling. So, uh, the premise behind this, we actually, uh, in case you're wondering uh, how this all came about, uh, Emerge provides a data automation platform for go-to-market teams. So the folks that are represented here are our target uh, segment or target audience. Uh, we work with a lot of SaaS and PLG companies. Uh, we recently ran a survey with uh, the same title. And uh, uh, Seamus, uh, thank you for co-sponsoring that with us. Uh, that survey resulted in about 70 responses from SaaS and PLG companies. So I'll drop the link uh, as I start to see questions come in. But I encourage you to go take a look. But we're going to ask some of the same questions of this audience here and get a live conversation going. Uh, so the first question is, how do we define growth? And uh, obviously, a lot of different ways. But how do you define growth and how do you measure what metric do you use to measure growth? Um, so Irene, why don't you start us off? Sure. So taking the customer success perspective, my kind of, I measure growth two ways, both net recurring revenue, which is the revenue measure and customer retention rate, which is which customers are staying and which customers are leaving. So from a metrics perspective, you know, my North Star is really the NRR. That's what I look at the most and focus on the most. But I also look at a bunch of other things, including gross, uh, gross revenue retention and gross logo retention by segment. I, there's there's one other metric. I just want to mention real quick, one other metric, which doesn't get measured very much, which I do measure, which is the cost to retain a customer, because sometimes you'll have a customer that's costing you more than they're earning. And that's more of a customer success than a revenue metric, but it is one of my North Star metrics. Perfect. Uh, so NRR is what I'm hearing as the North Star metric. And then there's a couple of others that support that. Rob, anything different that you propose? Sure, revenue. Top line revenue. Uh, it's what Top line does. revenue. Yeah. Everybody cares okay. About. And the only other thing I'd add would be new customer acquisition. How many new logos do we add? How much How much revenue do we drive? Perfect. Perfect. And then, Seamus, you're the guy who comes in and measures all of this across the board. So uh, what do you look for? What do you, what do you measure when you get asked to do this for your clients? Yeah. So I think Irene and Rob are both, you know, right on the money in terms of what I get asked for. Uh, what I think that you know, we also take a little bit of a, a, of a, you know, maybe slightly divergent view on is um, we view growth uh, with a slightly different measuring stick, right? We're looking at systems and system maturity and process maturity just as much as we are um, those actual top line metrics. So things like, you know, how many MQLs are transitioning over to SQLs, right? And how many of those are converting into, you know, actual, you know, revenue, 
right? What does that CAC to LTV ratio actually look like across the entire customer journey? Um, and, you know, similarly, how, how well are folks adhering to those processes and systems when they get put in place? So slightly more of a um, uh, uh, less quantitative perspective, probably a little bit harder to track, um, but certainly really important when we're talking about not only just growth, but sustainable growth, right? That's kind of our, our North Star. Got it. So, so Seamus, I'm hearing a little bit of the funnel view coming out in the conversation that you're describing that leads to revenue, that leads to new logos, leads to NRR, uh, which is which is great. Um, so, just just kind of uh, building on that, you know, uh, obviously we set up the topic to be intentionally controversial. So, uh, there are multiple parties that uh, participate in driving growth. Uh, tell us a little bit more about how each of you kind of think about the role of each one of the different organizations in driving growth. So uh, Rob, I'll maybe start off with you this time. Uh, so uh, repeat the question, what, what's our role in driving growth up front? Yeah, like, you know, you look across sales, customer success, uh, marketing, ops, et cetera, sure. uh, kind of all uh, working towards driving growth for a business. And, and, you know, we measure that in new logos, NRR, revenue, et cetera. But yeah. how, would you, how would you see different teams sort of contributing towards that? Well, I mean, we're all, the, the, the sad truth is we're all critical, right? Like, so it's, it's not just one person. We all work together. We are a team. Um, my answer would be product, product's number one, right? Do we have a product that has a unique value proposition? How do we have marketing announce that, aggregate leads and demand gen and flow and sales? Do we deliver? Do we connect customers with our product, contract them, get them in and using? Um, and at that point, it's sort of about customer sat, making it, make him happy and expand it. So uh, I think from the sales perspective, it's really about the land motion. Um, there is typically also an expand motion that could either be part of that same team or potentially a different team that's analogous to that. But um, I'll, I'll cut my answer off there. Got it. Got it. Irene, what do you think? Well, I think, um, you know, I agree that the, it's the C-suite, the whole, everybody owns growth. I mean, everybody has a part of it. It's a puzzle and it's layered and, you know, the sales has the top line. I, I love that Rob mentioned his metric is the top line and I mentioned my metrics are the re net recurring. And this, so there's kind of this pre and post, um, which I think is sort of legacy, actually, the pre and post. But each org owns something. And I do think that the product team has a key part. And I know we're going to talk more about that because if you don't have a decent product that matches the go-to-market, then you're not going to, you might be able to sell it if you're really, really good at selling, but you're not going to be able to retain it long-term. And it's much easier to sell it if it's adding value and fits a lot better. And then the the debt, the rev ops or the um, CS ops, sometimes there's a CS ops team also in there that works together. They, they kind of have to look at what's happening under the scenes and be the yellow flags for what's coming up so that you can adapt and adjust. Got it. Got it. Um, and, and Seamus, you obviously see this across a number of clients from your lens. So uh, what, what's your, what's your take? And I'll, I'll maybe throw in the immersive take here after, after you go next. Yeah. You know, I would say that two things here, one is, is Irene, highlighted something which is really fascinating, which is to say, what are those yellow flags, right? Um, and I think that that's certainly an element. I would also say that, you know, what's common amongst startups almost, you know, across the entire board is scarcity of resource, right? Yeah. So whether that's scarcity of time, scarcity of funding, or scarcity of market exposure, or whatever it is, right? You can raise $100 million and still have scarcity in, in some respect. I think it's RevOps job to, um, help attribute where those resources that you do have should be spent for the greatest opportunity for return, right? And so part of that is highlighting, you know, those yellow flags that will be standing in the way of growth, right? And part of it is also highlighting those green opportunities, right, where the properly infused capital or, you know, time can net the greatest return uh, in an eventuality, right? Part of our job is to be able to say, you know, you're at a series A, you know, stage now, but you're going to try and be at series B in 12 months. What do we need to do in between now and then from a growth perspective? And how do we get ahead of that jump in order to uh, make the, the foundations that much more scalable? And so, you know, I don't disagree, you know, with Rob and Irene, each 
department owns their own their own you know prerogatives um i think it's it's the job of RevOps then to kind of see across those departments and say overall right how do we um how do we make folks uh jobs a little bit easier right how do we provide the yeah. fuel in the right ways at the right times so uh seamus you brought in this concept of the stage of maturity of a company series a b etc in terms mm -hmm. of where the company is and it's and its maturity curve and I know, Rob, you've taken companies from very early stage to later stages to, you know, now user testing public company. Uh, let's let's touch on that a little bit because I think the the requirements change uh, on who takes ownership of growth as you go through that maturity curve. Uh, I'll share our example at Immersa. You know, our first hire uh, was really in marketing to create some awareness about who we are and what problem we're solving and see what that leads to in terms of conversations with uh, with clients. And, uh, you know, we're, we're an early stage uh, company ourselves. But what does that journey look like as you go from one stage to the next? And there's actually a very interesting perspective that emerged from uh, the webinar, uh, I'm sorry, the white paper that we put together, which I'll share in a moment, but I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, uh, as well. Sure. I mean, sort of high level is experimentation up front, you know, say where Immersa is, where you have a concept, you're building a product, you're testing it with net new customers. As a founder and an engineering team, you're really trying to sort of understand what the market wants, what they'll buy, where they see value. Um, I think as, as you sort of find that fit and you raise money, you're trying to scale, right? So how can you accelerate growth? Um, you know, how many, how much marketing and sales dollars can you put forward? that results in how much customer acquisition. You know, as you scale up going through an IPO, right, where you're continuing to expand geographies, product offerings, uh, adjacent partners, things like that, you know, how do you make that efficient, right? How do you sort of, you know, think about the metrics and ratios of, of salespeople to sales consultants or engineers to CSMs, et cetera, and you're trying to drive, you're building a company at that point, right? It's not just a research project that, that has some um, you know, some, some connection to customers. So um, I, I think it, it really, it, there's different personas that, that fit really well. I think that creative persona up front is really key. You know, you, you've lived it at Adobe where you're, you know, in a very large company to building a new product um, that's starting to rev up space. It, it's really a, a different engagement model than, than, you know, a hyperscale company like Adobe. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, um, Irene, I'm going to point to you next because this study that we put together essentially indicated that a lot of companies are hiring customer success people very early uh, in their maturity as a, as a company, which surprised us. So I'm curious if any of you see that perspective uh, and, and, and why, like, you know, what's the role of a CS person in driving growth in an early stage company? Yeah, I think there are there's a lot of factors that affect it and in some cases it does make good sense to bring on customer success early when you have a few handfuls of customers and you're trying to vet out some of the um the usage and find that go-to-market fit that you need in the early stage as rob eloquently described you've got different stages of companies and you need different things both from a go to market and from a rev ops perspective in all of those areas. But I think um, it so much depends on the product. Think about the complexity of the product, how easy it is to implement, um, you know, and also the market readiness. Is it a new disruptive product that's coming into the market or is it something that's coming in to add new ideas and features onto something as well as the stage of the company? Is it, um, you know, are they in that pre in that pre growth market fit? That's when, when you hire a customer success manager, they're working so intimately, kind of in a white glove way with your customers post implementation, that they're able to provide a lot of feedback to the product team, to get you to the product market fit. And then later, when you're operating at scale, you know, there's kind of I see it as three phases. There's the finding the fit. There's the getting the scale, the initial scale, and then there's operating at scale. So when you're in the getting the scale, then you need everything. You need you need to be scaling sales, you need to be scaling CS. That's when RevOps is so critical because you have all that data, 
like Seamus said, you need to know where to invest it and how, which parts to put it in. And everybody always wants more. I fought my sales leaders every time and my marketing leaders every time for revenue because it's there's never enough for what you want. And then when you get to the at scale, you really need a different profile of people. You need different measurements. You've got to look at a lot of other things. Okay. Um, so at scale, uh, what are some of the metrics that become important from a growth standpoint? Particularly from a CS standpoint, Irene. From a CS standpoint, the it, it's a lot of the same, but you have to look at your operational. You, you need to enter in sentiment and you've got a usage and sentiment things become more critical. And typically what happens is you grow out of your segments. So you might do some early segmentation of your customers. Um, so you're doing your measurements by segment or by um, cohort. And then over time, as you grow, you find, oh, wow, we're going to really focus on these cohorts or these segments. And then you've got others that maybe you're not going to give as much white glove attention to. Then you have measurements that you have to do for engagement uh, out of usage and things like that, because you're not in there. You don't have a CSM in there talking to them anymore. So you have to have other ways to measure their engagement with you. Got it. Got it. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the role that data plays in all of this. And uh, Seamus, I'm going to turn to you on this one because I know your team actually works with a lot of clients where uh, you guys play a very important role in how you bring data together from a bunch of different systems. Tell me a little bit more about that. Tell me a little bit more about how, uh, you know, how data plays a role in the early stage of a company in, in terms of driving growth. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a, a nest here, right? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> the, the, the challenge with data, and this is what everyone's trying to solve for these days, is that you know you have too much of it, or you have too little of it. It's very rare that you have just the right amount, right? Um, and and what I mean by that is that it, it's either too noisy, or the sample size isn't enough in order to pull any real insights from it. Um, and part of the ways to fix that particular problem, right, is to Desegment, you know, your your engagements, and to try and desilo between, you know, CS data and sales data and and marketing data and all of those components. Um, but the, but the real, you know, uh, challenge comes back again to scarcity, right? Um, and usually it comes back again to folks not investing in the right data strategy at the beginning of an engagement, right? At the beginning of a, a startup, right? Um, and they only start to be, you know, have the quote unquote funding or have the focus when they get to a, you know, series B is when we generally see most folks starting to really take it seriously. Yeah. And the problem is that by that point, you have, you may have, you know, a million or more data points, right? Um, and uh, how do you, how do you take, you know, stock of a million data points and 40 different, you know, silos uh, in a way that doesn't completely burn down the resource sharing pool, right? And so uh, given all of that, uh, it can be really, really challenging. I'd say, you know, how do we get ahead of that, right? One of the things is to start early, right? And have a, a really consistent data strategy from, you know, a series A perspective, you know, onwards. Um, another is to take advantage of tools that are built, purpose built to consolidate that data and surface the insights. Right, because that will become less manual the earlier that you embrace it. Um, you know, the, the the reality is that it's an exciting time now where folks are bought into the power of data, um, and so getting you know executive sponsorship is becoming easier and easier for for folks in our positions to champion it. Um, and then it's time to go get the right tools in place and the right enablement in place to actually get the value out of it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would be my perspective. Any any other thoughts, Rob? What what's your take? Yeah. How no, does I, data play a role in driving growth uh, for the business? Well, I mean, I, I mean, uh, speaking from experience in sales, you sort of grab anything and everything you can possibly get to drive revenue and top line targets. I think what data does is it helps you refine what is the best, um, what is the best target, what's the highest velocity, the highest profitability, the biggest TAM, all those sorts of things. So. 
Um, I'm grateful, incredibly grateful for seeing that through the course of my career, RevOps played a more meaningful role in guiding a sales team and a go-to-market strategy around what's the most you know, viable segment, what's the most profitable segment, the most repeatable. Um, you know, it's easy to get stuck with whales that, that bring in great top line revenue, but take you off track from a product strategy perspective. Um, or smaller clients that maybe, you know, you can get, and you're trying to, to sort of, again, fill a quarterly target, but not necessarily see a lot of expand revenue or opportunities for growth with that segment. So um, I think RevOps and that instrumentation that it provides um, really can be transformative for guiding a company forward. Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to take this conversation into the RevOps domain a bit here. So we, we heard RevOps, uh, Rob, your point of view uh, provides the instrumentation. And uh, certainly, you know, QBRs, reporting, instrumentation, these are the words that typically come up you know, uh, our surface around the role of RevOps and, and the role that it plays with data. How about actionability? How about driving some action off of that data? Like, where do you see that sits in uh, in an organization? Who actually owns making sense of that data to the point where you can actually drive some action off of it? Is that to me? Yeah, I, I, yeah. anyone can pick it up and run with it. Yeah, I think data, data is, you know, yeah, there's, there's lots of data. I think Seamus is right. There's so much data, what do you do with it? I think there's the front end of that data, sort of thinking about it from a land perspective and a customer acquisition perspective. What's the most, you know, scalable, lucrative, repeatable, highest velocity um, acquisition targets you can do? So that's one. I think post, you know, landing customers, what's the expand motion? Are they logging into the product? Are they utilizing? What's your metric for, you know, success with your product? Is it some utilization metrics that you know will give you early, you know, like like Irene said, yellow red flags about usage and, and renewability. They're not logging in, they're not using it, they're not consuming whatever your metrics are, right? The likelihood they're going to renew is low, and the likelihood they're going to expand is zero, right? And so um, I, I think segmenting those data sets for what your objectives are from from a net new to net revenue retention, aka growth. Um, are really key, and then that divides up the responsibilities as to how you've organized the team. Yeah, yeah. I'll just add so, on to that, yeah, if I can, real quick. It. So the other the other piece to it about the data is, I think I have to go back and say that you need different data at different phases, right? So early stage, you need different data than you do when you're scaling than you do when you're running at scale. And um, what's really important from a RevOps or any ops perspective is understanding how the customer journey, the buyer through the customer journey is changing as you go so that you are collecting the right data. That's one piece. And then the other piece that I think a lot of companies don't like to go back and look at, so it's a little bit controversial, is you know, which features in the product is it that's driving the value and so this kind of plays into everybody's talking product-led growth right now. It's one of yeah. the new words. But the, this leads into that because you may want to hold back certain features in the product for expansion purposes, you know, and start to actually segment your product and your go-to-market so that people can buy up for different things. And that that can help a lot if you, you know, when you're, in the early stages, you want to give your customers everything for the high value. But as you start to grow, I think RevOps can uh, interact with product a lot to understand where the revenue is tying to key features and things like that. Yeah. Great uh, uh, call out there, Irene, about PLG and, and how various. And actually, you, you touched on something really important, which is how do you actually view your product in a strategic way to determine what you're going to release and when and what, you know, how do you package it up to where it actually helps drive growth for your product? I'm not sure a lot of product teams think of it in that way. It's more build it, ship it, and, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, and I think there's an opportunity there to actually create a strategy around how you deliver the product. Uh, I'm going to drop the link to this survey that uh, we did with over 100 companies uh, that you know, are all SaaS and PLG companies uh, addressing questions similar to the ones we're discussing here and get in the survey results. 
Uh, I think what was interesting to me in that conversation or the results that came back, one of the things that was really interesting is the fact that data quality remains the number one issue for RevOps teams uh, as they work through. So, you know, we, you know, Shane, as we talk about data as the new oil, well, it turns out it's more of an oil spill than the new oil. Uh, just the amount, the amount of work that goes into data quality to keep it all, all uh, uh, cleaned up. So any, any thoughts on data quality and how to manage for data quality in, uh, in your data? Yeah, so, I mean, I think this is where, uh, you know, the, the, the <laughs> RevOps gets a, an interesting rap in the, in the marketplace, right? And I sometimes view, view RevOps as needing to be the sort of the bad cop who rolls in on the motorcycle, right? And it's the, the bad boy of SaaS, right? Uh, nobody ever wants, you know, it, it sort of lays the hammer down a little bit in the proper function, right? Because the biggest way to keep data quality, you know, in a, in a you know, good state is with proper change management rules, proper centers of excellence around um, a data strategy, um, you know, locking it down so people can't just randomly import lists, right? You know, things like that. It goes all the way down from, you know, field level permissions all the way up to like an actual data governance strategy. Um, I'd say uh, the biggest thing is actually just properly enabling a team, right, to um, understand why these things are happening and then, um, you know, properly enabling your RevOps personas um, to be effective in their roles, right? Revenue operations is not intended to be um, sales ops, right? It's a different thing. It's a different function. Um, and too often... Uh, do again to that scarcity problem that we talked about that the, the, the functions get convoluted. And what happens then is that you end up seeing churn of RevOps folks and the loss of a strategy. And then that's where your data problems start. So I'd say foundationally, right, recognizing the importance of the function and where their time should really be spent is the biggest, you know, value prop, you know, or value add that you can take away today. Right. If this is really a strategic role and we're all talking about this in a strategic setting, then these folks really shouldn't be spending their time on, you know, admin surface level tasks. Right. Um, there's 24 hours in a day and, you know, somewhere between eight and four of those should probably be spent sleeping. So uh, the rest of that time needs to be very properly spent, um, you know, towards the goals of whatever that organization is. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so. In, in terms of uh, revenue operations, you know, uh, Seamus, one question I have for you is at what stage is the right time for a company to invest in RevOps? At what stage? This is, yeah. Uh, like all day, every you know, day. Companies approach you all day long with, I'm sure, with that question. So here, here, here's when people, I will tell you two, two answers to that question. When do people actually end up doing it? Most of the time they end up doing it between Series A and Series B right? They're doing yeah. it in preparation for a series B raise with the knowledge that they need to be able to pull the metrics for that series B raise. And they need to be able to do so with enough accuracy that they can raise the funding, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the answer for when folks should be doing it, it should be as soon as you possibly can, right? Pre-seed is, is um, challenging to do. Uh, but, you know, let's say realistically, it should be after you raise your seed round, and you should be investing in the proper technology foundation, and the proper operating structures and processes from that point forward. And that will mean that there will be hard decisions that need to be made about how resources are, are committed. And there certainly need to be more affordable options. That's why, you know, Carabiner exists, right? To try and be, you know, a slightly more affordable option than hiring the function in house. But yeah. the earlier you do it, the greater the return on investment later, because what we tend to find is when folks are going at that series B round, uh, there is a, metric truckload of stuff that needs to be cleaned up um, from, you know, the, the wild west days, right? And that is not only is it expensive, it, it, it takes the, you know, most valuable resource of all, which is time, right? Yeah. It takes yeah. time when everybody's trying to go and grow really, really fast. You know, the worst possible thing is you raise your round and you can't deploy the capital because you don't have the systems in order to support it. Yeah. Um, so, I would say just like, you know, building a campfire, right? You build a campfire, you have the proper foundation at the beginning, um, you know, proper little lean-to or log cabin or whatever anybody wants to build there. Um, then you can add the proper fuel as you have it uh, to make that yeah. a, a much bigger blaze. 
and, and Rob, you've been, um, uh, I mean, I'll come back to you with a slightly different question here in a moment, but uh, Rob, you've been through this journey uh, with Lingotag, uh, creating the business almost from scratch and then um, building it out. What, what prompted you to make a decision to invest in an operations function? You know, I, I mean, I would say early stage, I was more ignorant about the utility of, you know, beyond sort of, you know, Shane said it earlier, sales ops, rev ops, and sort of what the potential upside of rev ops is. I, I would sort of answer the question with a slightly different point of view in that early stage, we're all wearing multiple hats. I think that rev ops function should start to be served immediately, even if there's not somebody dedicated to it, even if there's not systems in place that you know would build that infrastructure um, i think it's important to sort of like understand its utility and value and connecting the dots between the whole motion of product market fit to landing new customers to expanding them to that straight up net revenue retention which you'll get measured on um, and and i think ultimately one one point i'd like to make is that this should all feed back to product right like we are as, as valuable as sales and, and success are and RevOps are, you know, are customers using the product the right way? How can RevOps be that intelligence platform for understanding, should our product be doing something different? Should it be doing something more? Um, is, it, is it equivalent and better than, you know, solutions in the market? And so, because at the end of the day, you know, like I think it was mentioned, I might mentioned, you can be a really good salesperson and sell anything, but it's not going to be a scalable business unless it has a ton of value and it's repeatable and it's high velocity. And that's where you see that A, B, C, D, IPL, right? So. Got it. And Irene, uh, the twist that I hear now more and more CS ops uh, roles sort of starting to fall in place. In fact, I was at the Gainsight conference um, a month and a half ago, and they were very specifically catering a specific, you know, set of sessions to that that persona. What's your take? Uh, is this something new, or is it just something that we're all hearing about now? No, I don't think it's new. I think it's something that is getting more uh, attention now that more companies are reaching, more SaaS companies are reaching the point of scale, and that's, you know, Seamus said you know, you kind of need it when you start to scale. I actually agree with Rob that you, you need the the work that the RevOps team does or the ops teams do earlier than that, but they but you probably can't, given limited resources, support a full team at that point. So you've got to have somebody kind of playing around in that area, and that's where the spreadsheet work starts, right? <laughs> you don't have tools yet, you can't afford them, but you've still got to be measuring and tracking things. And in terms of the CS operations, I think that the reason that it's got, there's two reasons why it's gotten so much prominence lately. And one is what I mentioned that more SaaS companies are reaching the point of scale now. And so it's critical that they do that. And the other is that there are things that you have to measure in customer success that are different than revenue. You have a lot of operational things that you need to measure in your mm -hmm. customer segments, in your usage, in your sentiment and survey responses and all of those kinds of areas along the customer journey, how, how quickly you're getting time to value in your implementations, is there things that you can do there that bring feedback to other areas of the company. They bring feedback to the sales team to say, hey, these are the customers that are being really successful. So sales knows who to target, right? And they bring things back to the marketing team in the same way. And they bring things back to the product team in terms of the features but they're different than revenue operations. They're actually customer operations. And then the other thing that we see, and I think this is partly because of where our economy is right now, you also have to think about where you're gonna have people because customer success can't scale with humans. You know, you've gotta have, uh, when you start, you're very hands-on white glove, dealing with all of your early customers really closely. But over time, you need to back off from that, as I mentioned before, and you have to pick your segments that you're going to do your white glove with. And then you've got to find automated ways, which is almost like a marketing automation, but it's not. It's customer automation, but it includes customer content, um, customer workshops, and things that are going to seed your expansion and, and ensure your usage and your retention. 
And those are operational things that somebody has got to manage in a one-to-many program with the email campaigns and the webinars and things like that. And that's another ops role that CS ops tends to play. Asim, there's something really interesting cool. here that I might, yeah. I might jump in and add, which is just to say that, yeah. you know, Irene brings up a really interesting point about, hey, we're moving into a different economic space, right? Yep. And I can tell you that earlier this year, right, folks were, um, I, I had it verified by multiple different, you know, funding sources that folks were receiving higher multiples by one to two X for clean data, right? Um, and I think that's really interesting. And it wasn't so much that it was based out around uh, the data itself. The data itself was not the valuable part. It was what that betrayed to, what did that tell the funding source about the organization in which it was funding, right? Mm -hmm. If they had clean data and were able to get access to the metrics that they needed to and show the insights, what does that tell you about the maturity of other parts of the business and maturity of other yeah. parts of the process, right? Yeah. And so to both what Rob and Irene you know, said, right? It may not need to be a dedicated person, but having the mindset of an operations person, right? As early as possible, because it's not, that, that doesn't take, you know, a whole heck of a lot from a financial perspective, right? That's the lens of how you view the world, right? Yeah. Building in a way that's scalable, that's functional, that's, you know, sophisticated, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And not just reactive, right? To whatever it is that's on the table at the moment. Yeah. So Seamus could not agree more uh, with both you and Irene about the role that uh, the, the ops mindset role is so important to have, even as early as uh, when a company just gets funded or seeded and started. Um, I dropped the link to the white paper in the comments here. You know, it's interesting what we learned through the survey is 100% of the companies that invested early in RevOps we're showing 30 plus percent growth in their later years. So you can go look at the data and uh, benchmark yourself against that data, but it's it, it, it's based on the experience that, you know, we found that 70 different companies expressed a point of view uh, on this, So which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, okay, so I'm gonna shift to perhaps the last topic for the day, uh, which is the R word, you know? Is it a recession? Is it not a recession? And, uh, and you know, first, what do you guys think? Are, I mean, you know, what does the world look like? Are we, and what, and more importantly, what are you doing differently? Uh, whether Rob, in your case, uh, as a head of a, uh, of a business, or Irene, in your case, or Seamus, in your case, as you're advising other companies uh, in, in, your, in, in a different capacity, what should companies be thinking about right now in terms of driving growth, because it's clearly a different environment from what it was six months ago. So whoever wants to go first. Um, I'll, I'll chime in. I think we're clearly in economic headwinds at minimum, recession likely, you know, by whatever technical definition you want. Um, the, the, the What's the result? The result's the same selling motion, but probably higher rigor to it, meaning, you know, budgets are constrained and there's higher scrutiny as to spends Therefore, defending value and articulating value and sort of, you know, trying to reduce the perception and reality of risk from a buyer is key. So what can they buy? What kind of return can they expect? And what kind of time frame? How credible are you in defending it? How credible can that person be in proposing it to their CFO it is really the scrutiny I see. And so, um, you know, not to, not to answer on behalf of customer success, but I think what I see is you know, selling more land packages that are probably a bit more modest and trying to get success earlier in a customer engagement and having that sort of be, you know, deferring to sort of an expand motion sooner in a cycle, as opposed to trying to sell much larger contracts with, hey, you know, take or leave it. We've got a lot of top of funnel things that are flowing through quickly. I think the velocity and funnel is slowing down. And so um, I, think, I think there's just more work to be done in the sales and land process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all good, uh, got good insights, Rob. And I agree that the sales rigor is definitely going up, no question about that. I mean, what's your take? Yeah, I think, you know, we definitely are facing headwinds. In, in times of downturn, business is cyclical. So we've all seen this before and we know what to do. And I-, I Well, not everyone. 
Uh, that's <laughs> true. Younger people haven't. Us <laughs> old people have seen this before. <laughs> but I do think that the um, the other thing that tends to happen from a customer perspective, customer success lens or customer perspective, is that the um, that the you have to double down on your existing customers that are getting value and look at where you can expand. So I think, you know, Rob's thought about land with a smaller deal and then go into the expansion is a great way to go after it. But you also, you know, anytime there's a recession, somebody is benefiting. So you kind of have to look at your segmentation and see what's that narrow part of the market that's actually thriving during this, because there almost always is. So that's one thing. And then I think you just have to double down. You really got to look at where you can serve your existing customers and how you can retain them, which sometimes means taking a hit on, you know, some, it's not expansion, but you have to contract them a little bit in order to retain them for the future, because you don't want to churn them completely, especially in a SaaS model. Yeah, yeah, all good advice, uh, Irene. And in particular, this idea that that someone's benefiting in a recession and finer segmentation to identify where those opportunities lie is a really good one. Seamus, what are your thoughts? You know, I think uh, here's what it comes down to, right? Uh, when we talked about scarcity, that's the that's the name of the game, and in a recession, it becomes even more so. I happen to believe that we are we're going into a recession that is going to be significant. And it's going to hit SaaS in a way that's uh, even more significant, right? Um, I think other areas of American industry are going to be fine. Um, so, uh, you know, I have three motions um, that, that we're advising our customers to go through. Number one is auditing and assessing their current situation, which is to say, where are they? Where can they cut back? Even we, we cut back on unnecessary headcount recently. Um, we reduced our spend on a number of different areas, and it, that's all saving up the, the, the powder for where it, it yields the greatest benefit. Then it's maximizing what you already have, which is to say a lot of folks when, you know, time is, you know, when, when, when we have the money to go spend, we spend somewhat willy-nilly, right? And we buy point solutions when the reality is that we can um, get much greater value, right? If you bought something and you're only using 10% of that tool, get... 100% of that out of that tool instead of having to go buy something else. And then last but not least, it's it's build build what you don't have, right? Which is to say a lot of times um, folks can trim for optimization and then be sort of at a break even point, right? And and you might not be experiencing ridiculous growth and I know growth is 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 what we've what we're all targeting for, but you can certainly spend that extra time to build that foundation for acceleration in the future, which I think that's mm -hmm. Maybe this great opportunity is to say, hey, sit here, bide your time and put all put everything that you can in order for when that opportunity does happen um, to really pour the accelerant on and, and, and speed up again. Right. Yeah, uh, all, all uh, really good points, uh, Seamus. I really appreciate the, the feedback uh, and, and the thoughts that you guys have all shared today. Um, so we're approaching the last few seconds of this session. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, for the audience, thank you for joining us today. If you have any more questions, you can reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also find Immersa at Immersa.ai and contact us over there. And uh, we'll, we're happy to direct you to any of our uh, panelists if you have questions for them. Um, and, you know, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and uh, value that's represented in this community. And I want to thank... Uh, uh, Jared and his team for putting this together and, and giving us the opportunity to be a part of it. And we want to continue the conversation. So find us at immersive.ai and let's continue the conversation over there and, and look forward to, uh, to learning more from each other as we go forward. Thanks a, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.